Good morning, Southside Bible Church. A uh, special welcome to any of our guests here this morning. We're grateful to have you here worshiping with us. It's always a joy to have new, new people and in, in visiting with us to worship our great God. Uh, the missions conference, I believe, is up and online now. So what, what a blessing to my soul if you can uh, go and listen to that. It was excellent. I heard the ladies had a fantastic time this weekend and God ministered in a mighty way. So thank you for everyone who set up, tore down, served on that committee and all that you did to, to bless those ladies. Very grateful. This Saturday is the evangelism training. It's going to be on Saturday morning and I'm going to be teaching just kind of this chart that I like to present with the gospel and to help you kind of have just another way to just look at a systematic way of presenting it and your own freedom from there. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we just want to keep equipping the saints for the work of service to go out and proclaim this beautiful gospel. And then the newcomers class next week, I want to as well remind you of that. And the conscience class that will be going on in here for seven weeks is, is just outstanding material. Really want you to understand that. Infomercial's over. Um, except my pin, my pin. I got this sweet little young man in the church and... Um, he has this black suit. Is he here today, Josiah here? There he is. Oh, stand up for just, I hate to embarrass you, just up and down. Look at that suit. Yeah, yeah. And for Christmas, he wanted a Pastor Ken suit is what he calls it. And if I would have got that for Christmas, I'd have been so mad at my parents. And he ran upstairs and put it on and he, and he has a pin on his, so I, I get to be like Josiah now. And uh, I get to wear that same pin that he bought for me. So thank you, Josiah. This morning, we're going to be taken up in Romans again. So if you'll turn with me to chapter 8. What we're going to look at this morning is pure gold. Pure gold. We're going to get God's worldview uh, for us in this world. Paul's going to give us a theology of suffering and why, how to suffer well, how to hope in the midst of suffering. Just Straight talk about suffering, a real straight talk on how do we hope in the midst of it, how to be a bright light in the midst of, I want you to hear this, designed darkness by God in this world, the deep darkness that we're seeing all around us, wave after wave after wave, how not to be taken under by it and swallowed up and filled with doubt and unbelief and grumbling and despairing. What's before us this morning is how we groan and hope on our journey to glory. And so this is for the young kids. I love you guys. And this is what you need to understand as you start your journey. And it's for the old saints finishing up your course and the difficulties of a wearing out body. This is for you. This is for singles. And this is for marrieds. This is for believers. And this is for unbelievers because usually when an unbeliever comes into church, it's because you're suffering and there's something going on and you're beginning to say, what, what is this life about? Uh, how do I know this God? What, what is the whole picture? Well, this morning, I'm going to give you that answer. What is possible this morning in the Word of God is unbelievable. So let's pray and ask Him to meet us in a beautiful section of Scripture. Father, we come before You and I thank You for what we're about to unfold and I pray, Lord, that by your spirit through this truth, that you would reorient all of our thinking. How do we think about this world, this life, our purpose, our suffering, how it's going to finish? God, I pray that you answer all those things in, in every mind and heart this morning in a way that we will put you on display. We'll magnify your name. We'll glorify it in a dark and dying world. And so God, do mighty things. And every heart here this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we do, we live in a difficult day. The birth pangs of the end seem to be increasing. Uh, the restraining uh, influences of the Holy Spirit uh, seem to be lifted in our country. We're seeing things that we really never thought possible in our nation. COVID hit, caused many problems and deep hurt and loss even in this congregation. We're watching what's going on in Afghanistan. Hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, tornadoes just hitting 
everywhere in our country, and it just, just feels like the earth is groaning. <laughs> in the midst of all of this, we have access to the horrors and the realities of this world 24-7 due to the news and our social media. So we get no break from it. We've had a hard year of watching loved ones die. We, we've buried many of our loved ones in this church this year. I, I read that about 100 people die every minute in our world. And the bottom line is that the suffering of our world, it's great and it's deep and it's constant. And we're to weep with those who weep. I feel like that's my life. The prosperity gospel, that God saves you to give you health, wealth, and prosperity gains its footing because of this. It's so hard and difficult. I want to promise somehow to get out of it. And then it loses its footing because it's short-lived. This morning, we're going to look right into the face of suffering. And the question that must be answered is, why is the world like this? Why is there so much suffering? Is it ever going to end? And what I hear often, where's God in all of this? Is there a God with all this senseless suffering? Is he in control? And if he's in control, can he be good? How can these things be? And these are real and they need to be answered. And they can be answered. The um, Bible answers every one of them, even in our passage this morning. Every one of them will be answered. Thank you, Lord. Christianity is not putting our head in the sand and just saying it's all good. Ooh, I can't hear you. I don't want to look at it or think about it. I just, just like to say God is good all the time and all the time God is good. It's true, but it's not the full answer to what people are struggling with this morning and in our world. And what I've seen is there's a pressure in Christianity to not really deal truly with suffering with cute little phrases that we hold on to that break when the right amount of suffering comes into your life. Or to just fit in at a church and look good by saying the right phrases. And going home and secretly saying, how is God good? Why am I so sad and hurting? Am I the only one? And you just keep smiling then. This morning, I want to rip that open. What in the world is this? <laughs> I finally come to church and I get Pastor Debbie Downer. I could get this on the news, right? I'm going to go home and listen to Joel Osteen and get encouraged. <laughs> I want you to hear this clearly. You'll never be able to live with and through suffering without looking at what it really is. And then looking at the hope that God has built into this world. Where this ship is going, that we got onto by faith in Christ, it's more satisfying than the best day you're ever going to have than your best day here on earth. And the, the real problem needs to be looked at to get to the real answer. There's, there's no other way. And so what I'm asking this morning is that you would come journey with me in reality and truth in God's word to get these answered. And so turn with me to Romans 8. If you're visiting, we've been studying through Romans for a long time. We're in chapter 8, and we've been in chapter 8 for a long time. I want to set the context. As we've been looking at uh, a courtroom verdict, is we're all guilty before God because of our sin. Jesus Christ comes into the world, and he goes up on a cross and dies in our place, bears the wrath of God for our sin so he could forgive us. He could be just. God could be just and forgive you. And then Jesus came and lived the life you should have, and God will now put that to your account and treat you as if you lived that way. And now God can look at you, the God of the universe, and say you're not guilty. You're justified before God. You're accepted. Your sins are forgiven. You're in the courtroom, and God who knows everything says you're justified. And then we came into the living room, and he adopts us into the family. And now we cry, Abba, Father, his spirit bears witness with ours that we're children of God. And so we get justified and we don't live there. We live in the living room with God in fellowship and relationship, familial uh, relationship. And then we went into the vault room in Romans 8 and we learned that we have an inheritance that's unbelievable at the end of all of this. But Paul said there's a furnace room that we have to suffer with Christ 
to get to that inheritance and that reward that's waiting for us. And so the journey to get there, he says, we suffer with Christ so that we can be uh, uh, redeemed in Christ forever and get our inheritance together. And so it's a mindset that we need to understand. I'm joined to Christ to get justified, and we're so one that now I'm going to suffer for his name's sake, and I'm going to suffer with Christ, and I'm I'm going to get to glory and be glorified with Christ forever. That's the Christian life. And now we come to verses 18 through 25 of chapter 8. So this is what I'm going to call the groaning section. Uh, When you look at verses 18 through 25 and verse 18 through 22, he says, creation's groaning. Then in verses 23 through 25, he says, we as believers are groaning. And then in verses 26 through 27, he says, the Holy Spirit's groaning. In a different sense, we'll look at it next, next time we're together, I think next week. And so all this groaning in 18 through 25, so my outline is groaning. <laughs> this section is one of Paul's probably most masterful arguments, and that's saying a lot. In verse 18, 4. Verse 19, 4. Verse 20, 4. 22, 4. 24, 4. He's, he's got this sustained argument that he's going to just keep showing you and explaining and helping you understand, and we're going to d- jump into that this morning. And ultimately, this section that we're looking at will make its contribution to this whole chapter, 6 through 8, is that we have eternal security as the children of God. Nothing can take it away. Suffering cannot knock us off our course and destroy us. The law couldn't destroy us. Sin couldn't destroy us. The devil couldn't. And now suffering can't. And I want you to hear this. Depression and futility can't steal this away or take it away from you. Some of you just need to hear that this morning. Last week, we looked at Romans 8.18. Was it last week? I'm so lost. Was it two weeks ago? Two weeks? Man, it's hard getting old. I can't remember what I preached last week. (coughs) Verse 18, we looked at. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so Paul says, when you get to glory... All the suffering that you ever endured on this earth, in two seconds, it's going to be swallowed up and it won't even compare to what you're going to get at the end of this race. I mean, everything you've ever suffered, two seconds, gone. It can't can't even compare to what's coming for you. And we said that Paul's little gets on mine, his mind, he's looking at these truths and he's taking them to his heart. So he lives every day suffering I suffer for the name of Jesus, and everything I suffer isn't going to be compared with what's coming when I finish this race. That's how Paul thought. Your outline this morning then. Paul gives us two reasons why the believer considers then that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed. So how's that, Paul? How is that? I want to grow in what you said in verse 18. Well, four And we're going to see the first argument is creation groans in verse 18 through 22. So verse 19, the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And so verse 19, 4, he wants to demonstrate the greatness of this coming glory so that we'll consider it that nothing can compare to what's coming. Paul's going to show us the magnitude of what's coming and the vastness. And he does it, and this caught me off guard. I hope it does you as well. He gives an explanation of the present state of the universe. And that seems at first glance to kind of be a strange way to answer this suffering. It's designed. It's so broken that none of your hopes will work here on this earth. Uh, That is not God. Hope in anything other than God and it won't work out. (laughs) Do you feel better? That's not the final answer. First, we need to understand why the world is the way it is. That's what Paul wants you to understand this morning. If you are suffering here, and if you're not, you will shortly, we have to place it into its global and historical context 
and place it in God's plan of redemption. You need to understand this. It's important. So let's dig into verse 19. Key to the verse, creation. Creation's groaning. <laughs> That's, creation is all that God made. Man, angels, physical universe, animals, sea life, stars, sun, the oceans. It's the material creation. It's what we read about in Genesis. In six literal days, God speaks, and it's all created, organic and inorganic. Animals, flowers, grass, rivers, streams, and mountains. And so we see in our text this creation that God has made is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. They're they're longing for the glory when Christ comes back into this earth and makes all things new. When this mortality puts on immortality, I get my resurrected body on the new heavens and the new earth. When the curse that the devil brought in Genesis 3 is completely swallowed up and finished forever. That creation. And the subject is this word anxious longing. And this is an interesting word. There's three parts to this noun. And it literally meant to wait with the head raised on the horizon of where the expected object is to come. So it's, it's like cranking your neck, trying to see, waiting for what's coming. And he's saying creation is doing that. Commentator Douglas Moo said, it's creation is standing on its tiptoes, cranking your neck, waiting for a loved one at the airport. When me and Laura got engaged, she, she did a, a, a dirty thing. She went away to another country for three months. And... She studied abroad in London, and I remember when she was coming home at the airport, every time someone's coming off that plane, I'm cranking my neck, you know, is, that, is that her? And I'm looking at this going, that's the picture here. I, I can't wait for what's coming. This is not saying that creation has a mind and a will and effect. Have you ever seen stories and movie books when, when the humans walk away, they talk to themselves, the the bunnies or the trees, and your, that, that's not what this is. This is personifying creation. Psalm 98.8, let the rivers clap their hands and let the mountains sing together for joy. And so in this personification, we have creation anxiously waiting for the sons of God to be glorified on tiptoes. And my question is, why is creation longing for this? Verse 20, Four, let me explain it further. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. It, it didn't want this. But because of him, God, who subjected it. It was subjective. This is an aorist tense where it's, it's like a snapshot of something in the past. And it's passive. It was acted upon. And so sometime in the past, uh, creation was subjected to futility in this little snapshot Boom. When was that? Well, God created the heavens and the earth, and he looks at them and says they're good. And then he makes male and female and marriage, and he says it's very good. And so this creation has no sin or pollution or destruction or plagues or disasters. Lion lies down with the lamb. God and Adam are walking together in the garden. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's paradise. The created place that God would work out his plan of redemption. And Spurgeon said, even in its fallen state, something so beautiful that it tells me this has been made to be the temple of God. And so here's this creation that's beautiful. And then we see the sin of man uh, brings in this curse that we now live under today. Adam and Eve sinned against God and they committed treason. And we don't trust you, God, for our ultimate good. You're holding out. If we eat of this tree, we'll be like God. And they just take all of humanity and drive us into death and the curse that all of us sit in this morning. And so you have to get this. God is so holy and just. And sin was so awful to treat him like this that a judicial decree was put upon this creation. And it was put upon humans. And we live in a world now that's under a curse. A world that was created to bless you is now going to work against you and it's going to bring futility as you wait to die from this curse as well, that the soul that sins will die, will all die. It's a double curse. And so what we see and live in this morning, it's not global warming. 
gases or pollution. It's not that we need more education, more government, better leaders. I want you to hear this. The world is the way it is is because God subjected it to futility. The world's condition is a judicial decree of God's response to sin. And in verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. It didn't want to be subjected to this. It wants to shine and do what it was made for and glorify God and serve humans. So I want you to hear this then, that the devil and Adam didn't have this design or plan. This is God's plan. And God subjected this world to futility. And futility is, uh, Solomon kind of brought it out the best in Ecclesiastes, is I'm trying to find purpose and meaning in life under the sun. And God sets him up where he can try everything in the world that could ever make you happy. And he goes to the highest degree and he keeps saying, every time I get it, it's futility. It's meaningless. It's like grabbing the wind. Oh, this will make me happy. No, it won't. And you're sitting here this morning, you know exactly what it is. This in the world is going to finally make me happy. It didn't. And that's what happened. The world was subjected to futility, meaningless, empty. Verse 21 says, we're, to, they were, it was made a slavery to corruption, <clears throat> to disease and pollution, decay, putrefaction, weeds, thistles, my life this summer, cancers, death, the law of thermodynamics, relationships break. Enough time, every family is going to break. Mental and physical issues. Poverty and starvation, sin of Romans 1, we're given over to it. The corruption in this world and the corruption in humans. Broken plans and hopes. Broken fill our land. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, I wonder whether the phenomenon of the spring supplies us with part of the answer to this. Nature every year, as it were, makes an effort to renew itself, to produce something permanent. It's come out of the death and the darkness of all that is true of the winter. In the spring, it seems to be trying to produce a perfect creation, to be going through some kind of birth pangs year by year. But unfortunately, it does not succeed, for spring leads only to summer, where summer leads to autumn and autumn to winter. Poor old nature tries every year to defeat the vanity, the principle of death and decay and disintegration that's in it. But it cannot do so. It fails every time. And it still goes on trying as if it feels things should be different and better but it never succeeds. He says it goes on groaning and travailing in pain together until now. And I know you're saying, I told you that God was mean and he just wants me to be miserable. This is my problem, futility. I live in it every day. And what you just told me, pastor, is God's at fault. I finally convinced myself it was my parents' fault. It's Pastor Murphy's fault. And you just told me it's God's. It's his doing. What I want you to hear this morning is there's a purpose behind it. In fact, the purpose is why he even created and brought all this to pass, why it even exists. The world is not spinning out of control. It's spinning exactly according to God's will and and large and right into the very details of your life. And the reason and the goal of why and where all this is moving is I want you to hear this morning why this isn't hopeless. Why it doesn't stay dark. Because right now it's like a cave. We're told in Isaiah the whole land laid in darkness. The light of the world was born into this howling, cursed wilderness. Eternity stepped into time. God himself wrote himself into the story and he came to the earth he created. And the question is why? And if you'll look at me in verse 20, maybe the two sweetest words in the Bible. It says at the end of verse 20, he did it in hope. He did it in hope. He did it so that we would find hope, not despair. You can have hope in suffering. And my question is, what kind of suffering? Well, verse 18, it says the sufferings of this present time. So anything from the, the, the fall to, to Christ's return, any kind of suffering in that, 
the curse to glory and that any time in between, suffering that is global in all of history, it's been going on since the fall, you are not ha- you're not being picked on. The suffering and futility and corruption and that all of us are dying. We're persecuted for our hope. That's suffering. The ones who are persecuted this morning because of the name of Jesus Christ. When a world has gone crazy. When a country is deteriorating right before your eyes. When our lives are trying to find happiness every day and it's like building a snowman on a hundred degree day. America, the land of hope and opportunity, liberty and justice. No. What, what do you do? Just keep trying. Keep investing. Keep looking for that one person who's finally going to make everything right. If I could just get the right job. Many of us every day are trying to make Denver paradise. And we are always looking for the right circumstance. If I could just get this. I just want a family without strife. It's called heaven. I want a kid who's happy. (laughs) It's like building sea castles on the beach and the waves. Every time you build something, the wave comes and takes it away. And that's the vanity and the futility that has been brought upon this creation. And we still think something on this earth is finally going to bring me peace. Every one of us do it. I do it daily. I got to fight this. I want this place to be paradise. And I'm happy when there's no waves or ripples. And when there's a wave or ripple, I got to fix it to find hope and peace. We still think something on this earth will finally bring me peace. I had a guy who went to this church a while back, and his whole life was retirement. Every time I had to counsel him, they were fighting because he he programmed when the furnace would go off and to what temperature so he could save every penny possible for retirement. It was his life. And then he retired, and his wife got sick, and he couldn't travel. (coughs) That's a sandcastle. And maybe you've come this morning looking for that and you just can't find it. And you're like, is there any hope? How do I ever find hope? And I am so glad you came. I want you to see the design. The curse subjected this world and us to futility. And we're seeing its darkness and its brokenness. And we sit in depression over it. What is the riddle of life? I can't figure it out. I can't get the key to open it. So this morning, I'm begging you, don't stop short of why. So that you would not make this earth your paradise. Most of my counseling is that we make something here our hope. And then when it breaks, how do I deal with my brokenness? It's real, and it's why we weep with those who weep. But is that all that life is? No. This little phrase, in hope, right in the midst of this futility, I'm cursed, and this world is cursed. And right in the middle of it, in hope. Well, what is it? Go back to verse 17. If you're children, you're heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Your inheritance at the end of all this suffering, all this futility, is God. Jesus Christ, joint heirs. You're going to get everything at the end. Verse 18, when glory is revealed, all your suffering will seem like nothing. When this age is over, you will see the beauty that is unbelievable. God and join heirs with Christ in a new heaven and a new earth, and there's more. Verse 19, the anxious longing of the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. We're longing for that day when, when we'll, we'll be revealed with a glory ourselves. Guys, we don't just go into glory. We're a part of it. We're going to be made glorious within and without. We're going to be saved to sin no more. I I get God and I I don't have sin and I'm going to be glorious within and without in this new heavens and new earth. We're going to be revealed. Right now we don't look like much, but what has happened on the inside is going to break to the outside and we'll get our resurrected bodies. I don't even know what those look like. I know Jesus came and he, he comes through a wall and they think he's a ghost and then he grabs a fish and starts eating it. I have no idea what these bodies are going to be like. But I know this, I get tired and hungry and sick and my sight's going and my hear. I, I used to laugh at older people when they couldn't hear. And now I find myself going, huh? What? It's not so funny. 
kids. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm discouraged with how little I've grown. When I got saved at 21, my expectation for what I was going to become for Jesus Christ was way bigger. I'm just discouraged. But one day, I'm going to look at all of you and you're going to look at me. And we're going to shine with radiant righteousness. I'm going to be blinding. <laughs> now it's just when I'm on the beach. This is so cool. In Romans 8.18, glory is going to be revealed in us. You're going to be changed. And I want you to hear this so that you will have the capacity to enjoy what's going to be revealed to you with the fullness of God. And I don't know what it'll be like without the redemption of my body, that glory revealed. I think it would have burst the old wineskins of my body because this is going to be so infinitely good. Jonathan Edwards and many of the theologians they, they've, they've, this is speculation. But, but if, if you have four senses here this morning, it, it's so much harder when you can't see and when you can't hear or you can't smell from COVID. It, it just, it makes such a difference to have four senses. And they think we might have seven senses be able to take in the fullness of God when we get to glory. I, I do not know what it's going to be like. It's just going to be so beautiful. And again, when this happens, after two seconds, it's going to outweigh every suffering that you've ever endured on this earth. So this morning, what I want you to hear is in hope. You have a hope that is unbelievable in this fallen, futile, broken world. And it's groaning to be set free from it. And so if children, you're joined in with Christ, if we suffer with him, and if we suffer with him, it's the futility, the corruption, the persecution, all on the way to glory. We're going we're gonna to give out. We're going to suffer. We're going to get sick. We're going to have people hate us for the name of Christ. All these things are going to come upon us. These are the bloody seas that you must sail to get to the glory when you dock of the new heavens and the new earth. It's the way Paul thought. This is the design of God. In this wilderness is futility and suffering. And this world will be depression and frustrations and confusions. I don't even know what God's doing right now in my life. Struggles, enemies within and without, cancers and broken relationships. So that in the middle of it all, we would hope. We would hope in what God's going to do with this earth and what he's going to do with us and where he's moving it all to set us apart from everything in the middle of all this. This little diamond filled with hope is so bright and so beautiful that the world's going to say, what's the hope within you? Churches quit hoping. We want to make America paradise. And, in the, and you're not. You will not be able to make your life work. And in the middle of it, I can hope in what God's doing. For we know in verse 22, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The whole creation is in the process of trying to give birth to something better. It's groaning for its deliverance from futility and corruption. And so what we see here is a beautiful connection. There's a connection between man and creation and this coming redemption. And everything's looking forward to Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, set, set humanity free. Let them go into the fullness of what they've been made and what they are, the children of God. And then creation gets to be set free from all of its futility. We're tied together. And when he comes, this creation will be set free from its bondage, paradise regained. And it will enter into its glorious freedom and serve mankind and shine like the glory of God. The universe was created for us, not us for the universe. And its desire is for us to worship God. <clears throat> so creation is in labor, so to speak. It's like a woman delivering, delivering a baby, uh, just in labor. And, and there's going to be a baby. And it's groaning. And, and what's going to come out is the new heavens and the new earth. The labor pain is the misery of this world and the futility and the corruption. And, 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 and he's saying at the end of it, the baby is going to be called the eternal kingdom of God and glory. 
And so the child of God, there is a category for your pain and suffering this morning. It's not meaningless. And it's not that God has left you. And it's not that he doesn't care. And it's not that he can't stop it. But it's that you would hope. And he's purifying our hope. with Every affliction, every futile thing, he's purifying it. So we don't hope in this. And that's what affliction does. Second point, believers are groaning. Creation isn't groaning alone. We're joining them. Verse 23, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, which is everything we've been learning in Romans, this, this salvation, the Spirit now dwelling within us, new, new birth, new life. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Uh, and in Romans 8, 11, it says, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the first fruits of the spirit, we have them. And even we ourselves are groaning within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body where we're going to break forth in this inheritance. And so we are under the futility and the corruption. And in Romans 7, we learn that we still have sin remaining. And as we live in this broken, fallen world, the hardness of it and the difficulties of it and my body deteriorating and decaying and sin that fights me on a daily basis, I'm just groaning. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Boom. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And so we're just groaning to be set free from all of this. Are you groaning? Don't you want to be done with this? Why do you want to keep holding on to this earth? It's futility. It's corruption. You're falling apart. You're dying. Your sin is still just alive. Like, why? Let's hope to finally get the deliverance from all this. We're, we're groaning like a woman in labor. And we're wanting the baby, which is putting on immortality. Forever. I'm gonna, let's, I got a whole bunch of verses, but I'm out of time, so I'm going to read just one. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Here's, here's the birth. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, our resurrected bodies. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So guys, this is where our hope lies in the glorification of our bodies with God. At death, the believer, his spirit goes to heaven, the body goes in the earth, and one day Christ is going to return, and these bodies are going to be resurrected and glorified, and they're going to join our spirits that have been made perfect, that are now in heaven, and we shall dwell in these glorified bodies on a glorified earth with God forever. That's your blessed hope. Not getting this world to work for us. Do you see the difference? It's not figuring out this world and making it work for you. We have a hope of what's coming. And man, these signs are thickening and it could be today. Are you groaning for this? Or are you groaning because you can't get enough of this world to work for you this morning? What are you groaning about? This is the blessed hope of the children of God. And in verse 24, and I'll close out after I make about 20 points of application. And we'll hit this more next week. But for in hope, you've been saved. Guys, your salvation is in hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, everything I've just described, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. We won't let go of it. We won't be moved away from it. Everything that comes up against it, I won't let go of this hope. And I'm waiting for it, and I'm hastening it, and I'm urging it on. This is what I live for. I pray that that would set you free this morning. So let's close out with some application, and then I'll let you go 
fellowship. This is what I see as a pastor and in my own heart. Some of you stop short because you see the futility. And you, you, you see the, the brokenness of this, this world. Many philosophers and, and poets could see the brokenness of the world and they took their lives. And then, then there's those like me that you just walk around with your head in the clouds and you don't notice the futility. But deep thinkers battle depression because you're looking at this world and you're seeing it's broken. It isn't working. And, and, and in this text, you're stopping short. And you're living in despair and discouragement because by faith you get this. By faith, we're to hope in the middle of all this futility to be different than anyone else on this earth. I am not trying to get earth. I got a short little life called a vapor and all I want to do is make much of Jesus Christ, know him, make him known and suffer with him to get to my hope, to get to glory. That's what your life is about. It isn't to, to build your kingdom here on earth and be the greatest person who ever lived and write things and create everything. I am on this earth to shine like a diamond of the hope that I have in Jesus Christ and his coming glory. Yes. I heard a great illustration this week. You tell me if you like it. This guy says, picture two women. They, everything that they own is in their purse. And each one of them have $1,000 in that purse. And one of the women, though, just found out she inherited $10 million and Ed McMahon or whoever is going to bring the mail tomorrow and give them her $10 million. And that day, both of their purses get stolen by the same crook. Crook. And the lady with $10 million coming, you know what she says? That's an inconvenience. I got to go get a new license. The other lady's in total despair because it's all that she has. I can't even buy food. That's, I just lost everything. And the question is, why are there such different responses to the same event? Because what you know about the future completely determines how you process and respond to the present. And some of us are living our lives like that's all we got is what's in that purse. And when the things come, we're, we're undone. But the one who says, I got 10 million coming tomorrow. I got glory at the end of this life. I can hope with everything that comes into my life. It's not going to throw me off course because this train's bound for glory. Open the eyes of my heart Holy Spirit, that we might know what is the hope of the saints and all the glory of our inheritance. God, I want to live into this. Secondly, I want you to get how holy God is and how much he hates sin. Because I don't want anyone in this place to say that was an overreaction in Genesis 3. And what I want you to hear is that is who God is and he is a holy just right God to subject us to futility for the sin that Adam and Eve did against him. And I want you to quit pointing your finger at God and telling him what he can and can't do and say, I better be right with a God like that. And he sent his son into the world to make a way where you could be brought back into a love relationship with God. That's what I want you to focus on this morning. Third, I've said it before, I quoted Keller where he said that you could enjoy creation now more than anyone when you understand what it's all about, the whole plan and what I'm here for. And so now when I'm not trying to make earth my heaven, where I get my hope and my happiness and my satisfaction, when I quit trying to do that and I get it from Christ, I really can enjoy this, this uh, subjected to futility world because there's sweet little things that God has blessed us with and given to us. I got a little granddaughter, and I'm enjoying her more than, than my kids. <laughs> and, and it's not that my kids are bad. It's, it's that I was so nervous when I had them, like, Lord, don't let me mess them up. And, and with her, I'm just like, I'm free in the gospel, and I'm just like, I can just enjoy her. Without worshiping her, I can just enjoy. I, I could, food's tasting better. I, I mowed the grass the other day, and I was just looking at it going, man, that looks good. And I'm, when I'm not trying to get heaven out of this world, I'm telling you, 
you can enjoy the things that God's given you and you can weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So I'm not Debbie Downer. I'm trying to teach you this morning how you can enjoy the things that God has given you here because you're not making them ultimate. I pray that you get that. Fourth, as a church, we need each other because we're going to deal with suffering, aren't we? If that's what this world is, we're all going to suffer. And I need help in my suffering. And I need you when I'm suffering to come and say, Ken, this world isn't your hope. You, you, you might, your cataracts might have just broken, you can't see. But I want you to know what's coming for you is you're going to see the face of Jesus one day. And I need you to come and remind me of my hope when I'm groveling because I thought this was my hope. And I need all of you in the body and relating and reminding me of what my hope is. I don't care if the Broncos win or lose. Well, a little bit. But <laughs> you come and encourage me with hope. That's what, that's what we are. We're, we're a living organism to keep pointing each other to the blessed hope. <clears throat> that's for free. Number five, I think it's five. Never take God out of suffering. I watch this all the time. We're, it just, it, God's a deist. And he's just up in heaven, and he's just kind of letting this, work, this world go, and he can't stop suffering. He really just is, doesn't really even care about our suffering, or if he does, he can't do anything about it. Or you say the devil is sovereign, and he's the one doing all this, and God just can't stop him. And I just want you to stop. God subjected it to futility. And he cares about every detail and every suffering and every pain like a skilled surgeon cutting off flesh to cause you to hope in God, to hope in him. More and more, your suffering is not in vain, it's, but it's God who's bringing it for your hope, not for you to despair, child of God. Please don't remove God from suffering. Number six, believer, Go show, this is my call this morning, go show this world that Christ is more precious than anything that you could ever lose in this world. If you lose your purse and rejoice because 10 million is coming soon, you're going to stand out in this world like nothing else. You can take away anything and I want to show this world Jesus is better than everything that I have. That's our calling, to magnify the name of Christ. He is better than anything we lose in this feudal world. And number seven, I am trying so hard to help you, Southside Bible Church. I had to sit with a dear couple in this church in a hospital room as they held their stillborn child, and I'll never be able to get that out of my head, and I, I know they'll never be able to get it out of their hearts. Texted with John Collins' sister who's going to bring a baby home to hospice. We, we bring babies home to celebrate. And they're bringing their baby home to hospice. I was there when the sweet couple in our church had a baby and the doctor said something's not right. And they have a daughter with severe cerebral palsy. And all that goes with that, you'll never, none of us will ever understand how hard that is to, to never have breaks and all that you do in raising that beautiful little girl. I've sat with some of you when spouses walked away. I sat with some of you who got married and you had so many plans as you stood on that altar. And the first thing is in bed for nine months with COVID. Some of you sick who can't even come to church this morning. I've watched many labor with their last breaths as they entered into glory. Guys, what I'm giving to you this morning is so you won't get mad at God and say, this is wrong, I'm out of here. I want you to get mad at sin because it corrupted the world of futility and brought this judicial judgment upon the world. And I want you to rejoice in a God who has a plan of hope in the midst of all of this to save you eternally Whatever you face on the way to glory and his love is to deepen your hope and your knowledge of his love. Back to Romans 5. This curse is going to be lifted forever. Until it is, we will suffer with him. Number eight, I think. Romans 7. 
that we have remaining sin or Galatians 5, either text. We have remaining sin and we're going to fight this the rest of our days. Every one of us want to make paradise right here. And I testify to you in my own heart, I cannot believe how much I fight to want all the waves smooth. And God in his love isn't going to give me that. And so I want you to know that we're all fighting this. Every one of us have sin that's saying, hope here, this is going to make you happy. Go try this. Get more investments for security. You know, just, you're going to have flesh that's going to tell you this till you die. And so I just want to know that that's real. And that's every one of our battle. And we need to help each other fight for hope in the middle of it. And then lastly, this world exists to make a place for Jesus Christ to enter it and suffer and die in our place. The reason terror exists is so that Christ could be terrorized. I can't remember who said that. I'm, I forgot. He said the reason there's pain so that Christ could feel pain. The reason there's a curse is so that Christ could go up on a tree and be cursed in our place so that our sins could be forgiven. It's a beautiful design to bring about redemption in God's plan. And so I thank God that all of my suffering is to lead me to in hope to get to Christ. And when I get to glory, it's going to instantly be swallowed up everything that I have ever endured like a mom holding that newborn child. Have you ever met a mom and say, that wasn't worth it? Never. And I'm going to just be like, it was worth it. Instantly. I consider that our present sufferings aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. To God be the glory, amen? Unbeliever. You might not even know you are one. Have you tried because of this futility, different drugs, <clears throat> different counseling and methods and self-help programs, and you've gone to different churches, you've tried different boyfriends, different families, better job, more possessions, vacations, and nothing can lift the vanity or the corruption. If you can't find hope in this world, C.S. Lewis said you were made for something bigger, and it's God and what you're trying to find is, is you won't find in this world. It's so that you would look to Christ and be saved and brought to God so you could hope. He sent his son into the world and his son hung up on a cross bearing our sin and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's groaning and he's crying out, help me. And in Psalm 22, you didn't answer my groans or my cries. Why? Because the wrath of God is being poured out on his own son. And so Jesus is groaning all alone with no help from the Father. His cry to God is for, for why you're empty. Because of sin, because of Adam's sin, it spread to the whole human race. And now because of my sin from my own heart has brought separation from God and condemnation. And Christ came and he went up on that cross and he died for it. So that when you groaned, God, save me from this futility, from this sin that has destroyed my life and my world, that he could come now and rescue you and give you a hope, a hope past all this futility. Lift it up. I got glory. I'm right with God. My sins are forgiven. God of the universe is my father. That's why he, he, he groaned alone so that you would never have to groan alone this morning in your little futility world. You have Abba. What does he say? You cry out, Abba, Father. And he hears you and he comes and he loves you. And he draws near. He broke the, the penalty of sin for us on the cross. And he broke the power of sin's rule. And one day, the hope of glory, as he's going to break its presence in a new heaven and a new earth, when we dwell with God forever and we've been there 10,000 days, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. I offer Jesus Christ to you as the remedy for this God-forsaken land to give you a hope this morning in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, the wisdom in this passage is unbelievable. It helps us to understand this world, why it is, how it is, 
And it helps me to understand why every time I try to build my snowman in this world, it just melts. It's why every time I think this job is finally going to be the one that gives me joy, it never does. It's why that relationship, it works for just a little bit, but it never fills it. The only thing that can fill our souls is Jesus Christ. We have a void in every one of our hearts that is God-shaped. We've been made for him. And God, we thank you that you sent your son into this world so we could be brought back to you. And we thank you that now we suffer with Christ. And when we get to glory, we will never, ever regret one ounce of it. And so God, encourage every heart that's hurting here this morning, every tear that was shed even this morning with the pains that are represented in this body. God, lift their eyes this morning to hope where all things are going to be made new and made right. God, we just want to hold to Christ and hope for that and not get lost in this howling wilderness and try to make it our home or our life. Our life is hid with Christ. And we look for that day with an anxious longing. Our necks are cranked looking for that soon return of Jesus Christ. May it be today, Jesus, come back, take large strides, return for your bride. We pray even this day. In Christ's name we pray, amen.